If you like my videos, please consider supporting me on Patreon, subscribing, or commenting. Thank you. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, a little movie called Star Wars was released to an unassuming public. It combined a popular franchise with state-of-the-art vector technology to make a truly classic arcade game. What's the connection between this game and the movie Tron? Let's find out as we travel to a galaxy far, far away to learn the history of the Star Wars arcade game. The year is 1983. Atari is scouting potential IPs for its next arcade blockbuster. They have their eyes set on the movie Tron, and production is starting to ramp up on the game until... The movie opens and is a huge flop. Rather than scrap everything they have already done, they look to Lucasfilm to try and secure the Star Wars license. Since the last installment of the original trilogy of movies was about to be released, they thought it would be the perfect time. The Star Wars movies were already made into video games, starting with The Empire Strikes Back for the Atari 2600 and in television. By today's standards, it's a simple space shooter for you to take down as many ad as you can, but this was still fun to play back in the day. The other Star Wars game was Jedi Arena, where by using the paddles you control a lightsaber deflecting thermal bolts. Atari decided to use designer Mike Halley, who was fresh off of working on Gravatar, another vector graphic shoot 'em up. He was quoted as saying he wanted the title to be top notch because Star Wars was such an important license. He wanted the player to feel like Luke Skywalker, and he felt the only way to do that was to use the technology from another Atari hit game, Battlezone. Battlezone used wireframe vector graphics to find and destroy enemy tanks. Mr. Halley felt this was perfect for the Star Wars game. The first thing you notice when the game starts up is the wonderful sound. You'll notice faithful renditions of Star Wars tunes, and there's plenty of voice samples to boot. Initially, Lucasfilm did not want the voices to be used due to licensing, but some sort of arrangement was worked out. It's good that they were used because it really adds to the immersion. You can select easy, medium, or hard, with the latter offering scoring bonuses. You start out in the cockpit of an X-Wing, trying to take down as many TIE Fighters as you can. Instead of laser beams, the TIE Fighters shoot fireballs, which you can disable with your weapons. You can destroy the TIE Fighters by merely shooting them. Darth Vader's TIE Fighter is also flying around, and if you manage to shoot him, he is merely knocked off course. You can only take 9 hits until all of your shields are destroyed, and the game is over. After clearing enough TIE Fighters, you zoom onto the Death Star's surface. On the surface of the Death Star, you see a multitude of towers and turrets as they spit out more fireballs. After you clear enough of these, it's on to the Death Star Trench. The third and final stage sees you head down the trench to the conveniently placed exhaust port. The trench is littered with guns that shoot more fireballs and force fields you have to avoid. At the very end is the exhaust port, which if you can use the force, you can shoot and the Death Star is destroyed. If you miss though, the trench level repeats. After this, the game loops only with higher difficulty and more voice samples. It doesn't take you very long to complete a round. This is one of those games that you really need to play on an actual arcade machine to get the full experience. Trying it out on MAME is wonderful, but you need an actual arcade cabinet to get the full experience. The game is a lot of fun to play, but it's just a bit too short. That's what he said, right guys, because of gay? George Lucas was very hands-on with the project offering suggestions and advice. After he tried out the game, he let out a triumphant YES because it felt like being in the movie. The game uses a modified version of the Bramley Trainer controller with fire buttons molded from a real X-Wing yoke. Releasing alongside Return of the Jedi, this was one of Atari's last blockbuster releases. Over 10,000 cabinets were built, including 2,400 sit-down units. The sit-down units really feel like you were in an X-Wing taking out the Death Star. Parker Brothers was in charge of the first batch of home conversions. The first up is the Atari 2600 version. For the hardware it's running on, it's a decent attempt, but obviously scaled back. Graphics are okay, and it's fast, but a long ways from the arcade version. Now even though the Atari 2600 version wasn't that great, what was great was the commercial. Check it out. Oh, Star Wars. It's great in the arcade. Yo! The TIE Fighters! Fireballs! Coming right at me! Watch the laser towers. Aim for the tops. Pick them the cannons. Use the force. They're coming too fast! It's way! It's way! My shields are gone! All right! Stop going in! In a galaxy of video games, there is only one, Star Wars, the arcade game. The Atari 5200 version is a nice upgrade from the 2600. Nice graphics and the speed is fast. 
The problem lies in the controls, which are way off the mark. Up next is the ColecoVision version. The graphics are minimal, slightly better than the 5200 version. The scrolling is nice and fast and does play reasonably well. The first conversion to appear after the arcade's release was the Commodore 64 version. The good old Kami is not known for his vector graphics, so this ditches that style and boy does it show. It is fast and the scrolling is smooth, but the graphics are a bit tiny. The playability is very good. In 1987, software developer Vector Graphics was looking at older IPs to develop. Rather than go with Return of the Jedi, they went back to the original movie, back when Luke first started to develop incestual feelings for his sister. <laughs> These conversions turned out far better than the original ones. The Spectrum version is up first and is very well done. The limited color palette of the Specky doesn't hurt this title one bit. The sound is next to nothing, but the graphics look very close. The only problem is the speed. It does control good though. Next up is the Acorn Electron version. Now those of you who don't know, this was one of the best selling computers in the UK at one time. Why it was best selling, I couldn't tell you. I honestly couldn't find one positive thing to say about this version. It has a green monochrome display, slow speed, and hardly any sound. The BBC Micro version is up next. Now this is much better. I was pleasantly surprised with this one. Not only are the graphics fast, but they're reasonably smooth as well. The sound is a bit iffy, but the rest is a very good conversion. Up next is the Amstrad version. I'm really impressed with the programming feats on some of these 8-bit versions. Aside from a little slowdown, graphically this looks very close to the arcade game. The sound is next to nothing, but otherwise, an excellent conversion. The Commodore 64 was such a huge computer that it received not one, but two conversions. This one was done by the aforementioned Vector Graphics and actually used Vector Graphics. The sound is nice with a few digitized voices sprinkled throughout. The graphics are good, but the scrolling is way too choppy. The MS-DOS version is pretty good for a 1987 attempt. Graphics are nice despite only having four colors. The sound is next to nothing and the scrolling is too choppy. One of only three versions to support mouse control which helps it immensely. Probably the best home conversion has to be the Atari ST version. The graphics look almost identical to the arcade game. Smooth scrolling and very good sound with all of the digitized samples. The game allows you to use the mouse, which makes it a much more enjoyable experience than a standard joystick. The Amiga version is up next and looks identical to the Atari ST. The sound is good, but shockingly, the voices are not as clear as the ST. The mouse control still applies, which makes it a very good conversion. Due to the overwhelming success of this game, a sequel was inevitable. In 1984, rather than release an Empire Strikes Back game, they decided to go with Return of the Jedi. Ditching the vectors and switching over to raster graphics, the game takes place over five stages. One of the big differences between this game and the original is that there are no shields. One hit and you die. The first stage sees you pilot a speeder bike as you try to make your way to the Ewok village. The second stage sees you piloting the Millennium Falcon as you go deep, deep inside the Death Star to destroy a reactor. The third stage is another speeder bike level only with the difficulty ramped up. The fourth stage sees you piloting an ATST as you try to make it to the shield generator. The fifth level sees you pilot the Millennium Falcon as you try to destroy a Star Destroyer. In my opinion, the game is okay, but it doesn't seem to have the charm or the immersion that the first one had. Oddly enough, the voice quality in this game is worse than the previous one. In 1985, going back to its roots, The Empire Strikes Back is released. Sold only as a conversion or upgrade from the original Star Wars arcade game, this sees you follow the exploits from the movie of the same name. The familiar first person perspective from the first game returns. One difference in this Walk game is the you. introduction of the Jedi bonus. Like if you complete it. certain objectives, sure you will get a letter in the word Jedi. Me. If you collect them all, you'll get a bonus. The first stage sees you take out 10 probots. The second stage sees you in your land speeder as you try to take out the ATST and the ADATs. You can either shoot them in the head or you can relive the movie by using your limited number of tow cables. The third stage sees you trying to escape through an asteroid field without taking any damage. This was not as big of a hit as the first game, mainly because the Star Wars craze was wearing off. This was released two years after the last movie. Another reason this was not a big hit is because it was just an arcade conversion. Arcade owners who were still seeing steady profits from their original Star Wars arcade game were not ready to upgrade to Empire. Well, there you have it, the original trilogy of Star Wars games. If you ever get a chance to try it out, especially the sit-down version, 
start the game up, fire up your blasters, and take down the Empire. Help me help you. What kind of games would you like to see me cover? Also, if you want to support me, please visit my Patreon page. Share, like, and comment so my channel can grow. Thanks for watching.